email is the most widely used communication method across the planet. But have any of you thought about how your messages are getting from one computer over to another? Well, when I asked around, the majority of the answers suggested that people thought it was similar to how instant messaging works, but this isn't really the case. So let's take a look at how email actually works. So email can be thought of as the successor to ARPANET mail, which was, I guess, the first attempt at connecting and sending mail and exchanging messages across systems over, well, what was before the internet. And email also existed in along with the birth of the Unix system. Unix mail started along with Unix's time sharing system where we can have multiple users that are using the same supercomputer, or I guess back then it would have been your mainframe. The original emails were between users on the same system. For example, if you have two users or multiple users on a server, it would be so that user A could send a message over to user B on the same system. Now on Unix, this is pretty simple with the Unix mailboxes. Usually those live in slash var slash mail on modern Linux systems. But essentially you can use the mail command, type out a message, say who it's for, and just you can just write the username for the person on this computer and it'll just deliver that message over to their mailbox. At, at that point, you could also just write the user at the host name of the computer and it would get send the message on the local network, so on and so forth. How this works is actually really simple. The, essentially, the mailbox is just a folder of these text messages. And when you write this message, the system's mailer agent will basically just take that, pipe it into this particular file in the mailbox. So when you're opening this mailbox, you're just getting these plain text messages that have essentially been copied over. So it's basically similar to if two users were to just agree, hey, here's my inbox uh, and here's, here, here's your inbox uh, and I'm going to use my, uh, Vim or Nano or whatever to write this message and I'm just going to MV it over into there and you're going to give me write access to that folder. So, and then maybe not read access, right? And then you'll have the read access to the folder. So it's just moving these text files around on the system. And I guess that's a pretty good analogy for how it started. And that's how mail on the same system works. It'll just basically copy the messages over. Now, this is great if we have all the users on a single system, right? If you have one server for the whole university, it's perfect, right? Everyone can send messages to everyone. That's uh, excellent. Who needs more than this? But of course, with ARPANET and uh, the whole aspect of connecting these different computers, we wanted to be able to send these messages across computers. Um, and I guess this is where part of... Um, RF, RFC 561 defined some of the early mail syntax, right? So uh, RFC 561, RFC is just a request for comment. It's essentially all the, it's essentially how standards for the internet were defined. I guess maybe they weren't originally designed to be standards, but that's kind of how, what it's turned into. Um, and it's run by the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force. But essentially this RFC, this request for comment, just defines what we now call email addresses. Um, so they started with the let's have the username and then let's put the at and then the host name of the server. This way we'll be able to address messages to users on different systems. So if I have an account on system A and you have an account on system B, then you can type Bob at A and then like Alice at B or whatever, right? You can have the username for the person who, who on the system you want to go to and then you will have the system name essentially. So it'll be like this two-spoke model. It's like how, I guess, phone calls back then would have been routed to the neighborhood's, uh, to the neighborhood phone line termination uh, center. And then from there, you could connect to the actual houses, um, so on and so forth. So it was similar in that regard. So there were a couple systems that we obviously needed that to transfer these messages between people, right? First, we need a system to transfer messages across these different computers. We need a couple applications to make this work. First, we're going to need something to actually move the mail around across these systems, right? Next, we're going to need something to actually be able to forward this mail to its intended destination because, um, you know, not everything's going to be connected together. And we're also going to need something to take these incoming messages on the system and distribute them to the users, right? So if I have 50 people on my server, I need to be able to take the incoming mail and say, oh, okay, yeah, this is for this user and actually send it to the correct inbox. And that's what we have. So SMTP is the simple mail transfer protocol. And that's the protocol that's essentially used to send and transport emails between systems. SMTP is very similar to how something like Telnet would work, where with Telnet, uh, Telnet is essentially the predecessor to SSH, where you can just send these uh, commands over plain text and get the response reply from the system. Think of it kind of like serial communication over the network. It's 
kind of primitive, but it's also still kind of common. So that's how SMTP works. Essentially, we're going to have the system. It's going to listen for commands and we're going to be able to give it a command and then send a plain text message over and SMTP will be like, okay, cool. I received this plain text message, forward it to something on the system that'll figure out what to do with it. Uh, the next piece is the MTA. That's the mail transfer agent. That's what's going to do all the forwarding of the messages. And finally, we have the MDA, the mail delivery agent. And that's basically what's going to take this incoming message and put it into an inbox for the users to be able to read. So these three components kind of make up how primitive email can get around. And in fact, today, if you want to set up your own email server, you're probably going to use very similar components. You're going to use something like Dovecot, you're going to use Postfix, and you're going to maybe use SendMail. Uh, and these are all components that will act as your MDA, your MTA, and your SMTP agents. Email was never designed to be what we have now, where we essentially just have Outlook and Gmail and people just use webmail, right? It was always designed to be this uh, approach where users would be logged into servers and they'd just be checking their mail on the server. And you, 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 might, you might wonder, why, well, why do we have these servers, right? Why can't we just use SMTP and MTA to just send emails across from people's computers, right? Why do I need to be connected to the server? Why can't I just send a mail to my buddy? Essentially, here's what it comes down to. The server needs to not just send emails, but it also needs to be awake and listening for incoming messages. This means that your server has to be running 24 seven for you to be able to receive incoming messages. You might see why this is, this might become a problem. If you wanted to run your own mail server, Sure, it's great when you just want to send out email messages, right? Just spin up the server, send your messages, and then you can power it off. But when you want to be able to listen, when you want to be able to receive messages, email doesn't work like instant messaging. There is no buffer on, like, those all, those all require a server to buffer the incoming messages and hold them until you can connect, right? And then it'll send it over to you. And that's how we use email now, but I'll get to that later on in the video. If you wanted to make your own computer act as a server and basically make peer-to-peer -peer mail, well, then your computers need to be on 24-7 so that when people send messages, you can receive them. Because remember how receiving messages works. To receive a message, they're essentially opening a session on your computer, and then they're just going to send their message over across over the network. So once again, very similar to something like how Telnet would work. You need to have a server running on your computer so that other people are connecting to your computer to essentially just copy their message over the network. And again, this is very similar to how internal, like intrasystem mail worked, right? On the same system. Basically, in the in, when we only had the one system, we were just using a Unix mailer to be, copy the messages across these or move them across to the mailboxes. And now we're doing the same thing just with computers on the network where one computer's literally just going to connect to the other computer to send its message. Now, once again, these messages are plain text and I will get to that later on in the video about how we actually get away with sending attachments and so on. So to be able to exchange and transmit messages with SMTP, you'll need to have an SMTP server that's always running on TCP port 25. Now, even if you wanted to do this, there's actually a very good chance that you wouldn't be able to because a lot of modern internet service providers will block port 25 uh, to stop people from running their own email server. And no, it's not because they're trying to be this autocratic, uh, you know, dictatorship or they're, they don't want you to run your own free mail server. Usually the reasoning ends up being that a lot of viruses on people's computers will start spewing spam messages to random people. Um, and they're just trying to stop their IP addresses from getting blacklisted. So uh, usually they won't let you send an outgoing mail from port 25. Of course, you can use alternate ports. And there's a whole list of alternate ports used by SMTP available. And the um, last thing I want to touch on about this uh, server architecture is that this whole system is, unlike what you might think, this whole system is fully decentralized, right? So for example, if you wanted to send someone a message using Discord, both people have to have Discord accounts on Discord server, because when I send the message, that message is going to stay on Discord server until I check it, right? Same thing goes for Facebook Messenger, same thing goes for WhatsApp, same thing goes for Signal, same thing goes for Telegram, so on and so forth. Same thing does not go for Matrix, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but essentially, for all of those, those are what I would call centralized uh, systems because everyone needs to have an account on this central server that's going to basically uh, coordinate uh, sending the messages across these systems. So everyone 
so if email had been centralized by, say, someone like Google, everyone would need to have made a Gmail account to send messages to each other. But you know this isn't the case, right? You have Outlook accounts, you got the Gmail accounts, you got the Yahoo Mail. But even before then, I would consider this like the final monopoly stage of email. Historically, if you look back, um, every institution would have had their own email servers, right? So if I worked at a company, the company would have their own email server and uh, they would give me my email inbox to use for work. If I was at a university, right, if you're a student or you're a professor or your faculty member, so on and so forth, uh, the university's IT would have their own email server and you would have your own mailboxes there, right? So then I could send messages from my computer over to any other institution. There was no requirement for everyone to have accounts on the same server. If I'm at U Waterloo, I have an account on the U Waterloo server. If you're a student at U of T, you have an account on the U of T server. And we can send emails back and forth. Email hosting was great for institutions and these big companies, but people had a hard time making their own personal inboxes, right? And for a while, a lot of ISPs would offer email hosting for their uh, customers. And in fact, I think I believe our ISP operated until 2010 or so, where they would host your email for you. And then I think they just outsourced the whole operation to, I believe, Yahoo Mail. So it depends. But just like how ISPs would provide you access to a network like Usenet, uh, they would be they would give you, give you access to your own private email inbox. Because as I said, there's no way you're going to run your own email server. But if you want to be able to have an email inbox, well, you probably want to partner with a server that can stay online. And that's how that worked. Now, and even in current day email, it's still decentralized. I can still use my U Waterloo email address, even though it's technically just a rebatched Outlook, to send messages to Hotmail users, Gmail users, Yahoo Mail users, Proton Mail users, Tudanota users, right? You can still send emails back and forth across any uh, email server. For a while, I ran my own email server. Of course, uh, when I sent messages, they usually just get filtered away as spam due to how IP address uh, whitelisting and blacklisting works. Uh, but I'll get but I'll get to that later on at the end of the video. There is no requirement for everyone to have accounts on the same server. I can run my own email server. Uh, you can use your institution. Someone can use Google's ma uh, free mail hosting, and we can all still communicate with each other without any issues. So uh, in that regard, it's actually quite a robust system. Be it is. It's quite a robust system. Um, because even if one of those servers goes down, well, it doesn't really affect the email network. Sure, they won't be able to send or receive emails, uh, but the rest of the email network is fine. Whereas if something like Signal crashes, well, good luck messaging anyone. Um, <laughs> you're going to have to wait for the server to come back online or Facebook goes out. Good luck using Messenger or WhatsApp. You know, you're going to uh, need that server to be online. Same thing with Discord. Same thing with a number of these centralized messaging services. Um, that's, I guess, one benefit of a decentralized network is it tends to be quite robust in network outages. All right, so I've talked about how good this decentralized email hosting is, but how exactly does mail know where to go when I send out an email message? So say I want to send a message from my, from my, my email server over to someone using ProtonMail, right? How do emails go from point A to point B? How do they know where to go and which server they need to be sent to? Let's discuss this. So say I have an email, uh, Tony at TonyTastrola.com. Please don't spam it. And say someone else has their email um, on their own website domain. Say you have Chen at Chench.ai. And we want to be able to send a message over to each other. How, do, how, how does this email know where to go? Uh, and a lot of it comes down to yeah, DNS once again. So as I said, originally, you might have used Originally, you might have used just the server host name if you're on a local network, right? You could have, um, if they were fully unique, you could have user A at whatever server name. And it would know that, oh, oh yeah, that, that host name, we, we can just look up in our local router's DNS, find where it needs to go, send it. And it's basically that, but on a bigger scale. So when you have a domain name, um, domain the d domain name's uh, DNS, which is the domain name service. So when I have a domain name like tonitastrola.com, um, there's something called DNS, the domain name service, which will convert that name over to an IP address because a computer doesn't know what tonitashulu.com is or what uwaterloo.ca is or what gmail.com is. Computers don't speak those words. They want IP addresses so that they can know where to route these packets and how to forward them along until they get to their destination. So computers want to work with these IPv4 or IPv6 um, IP addresses. Um, so 
DNS has a number of entries. For example, you have your A records. A records are what will take your domain name and turn it into the IP address for when you're trying to load a web page, right? So for example, if you go to my website, the A record will point to the IP address, IPv4 address of my server. You also have quadruple A records, AAAA. Uh, those are essentially the same thing except for IPv6 addresses. So if you want to open a connection with IPv6, it'll basically look up the domain name. Ah, okay, yeah, cool, that's the IP address. Tell the router, hey, I want to go to this IP address. And then the router knows, oh, cool, I can get here by taking this particular hop over to the next router, which will determine my next hop. So uh, we want to be able to use these IP addresses. And there's a number of other DNS entries. There's the text records that are basically just pieces of information you can store. There's CNAME records, which are essentially just aliases. But important for mail are the MX records. MX records are basically what tell you which IP address you want to send the incoming mail to. So if you wanted to send an email to my uh, server, it would perform the lookup with DNS. It would look up my website and it would look for, hey, is there an MX query here that tells me where this mail should go? Because you don't want the mail to go to the same server as web traffic would normally, um, just because usually people have separate email servers uh, for the reasons I'll get to later on. But essentially, it'll go and look up the MX records. And in my case, it'll see that the MX record points to Proton Mail, or it might point to your uh, registrar, your domain name registrar. It might point over to Google servers, might point over to ProtonMail, might point over to Outlook, so on and so forth. So it's going to look up the SEMAX record, and that's going to tell it where to route the email to. And in my case, uh, based on when I originally was planning this video, that would have been ProtonMail, but it's currently will go to Gandhi's mail server, which is where I have my domain name registered. Uh, your incoming message will basically look at that and be like, oh, cool, that's the server where I want to deliver this mail to. So it'll know that SMTP should open a connection to that server. Let's get back to my example. If I was sending a mail from Tony at TonyTashul.com to Chen at Chench.ai, but what happened is the same thing. Uh, when I go to send the mail, SMTP running on my server is going to ask DNS, hey, where should this mail go? Uh, and it's going to look at the MX record and it's going to tell it, ah, cool, here's where that mail should go and it should, it'll redirect it there. Um, say you have a Gmail address, right? Say your uh, Gmail is foo at gmail.com. Basically, same thing, as some people will look up, hey, what's the MX record for gmail.com? Because it doesn't necessarily know. It treats Gmail just like any other domain name. And it's going to see that, ah, oh, okay, it goes to mx.google.com. It's a different, do if it's a, it gives a different domain name. MX records don't have to be IP addresses, by the way. They can be domain names. So let's go say it gets this new domain name that's uh, mx.googlemail.com. Then the next step is it's going to do a DNS query on googlemail.com and it's going to find out hey what is the IP address of the server whose name is googlemail.com and it's going to use that IP address so it doesn't have to translate to an IP address at first it can be a domain name and the computer knows hey now I want to look up that domain name and it can be another domain name it can be another alias it'll look that one up and then eventually somewhere along the chain it's going to get an IP address for where it should send the mail to open up a connection and copy over the message all right, now let's talk a bit about the content of email messages. The contents of email messages are typically defined by RFC 5322 or RFC 5322 for those of you that are going to comment. Email messages have a number of these headers up at the top. These are things you would have seen as your to field, your from field, your CC, BCC, so on and so forth. There are a number of standard header items that can be used in email. So for example, let's start with the most basic one. You have your subject line. That's essentially what people treat as the title of the message, right? Uh, that's what it'll show up as in your inbox. You also have the from field and the to fields. Now, I think a lot of, I think a lot of people assume that these to and from fields are populated by the mail network somehow, right? The thing transferring the program will figure out where it's coming from and where it's going to, and it'll convert that to mail addresses. But that's not how it actually works. So then how does it work? Well, essentially, the sender gets to define all those headers. And it's just common convention that the from field would be the person who's going to send the message and the to field is the person receiving the message. But in fact, you can, if you are the one sending the message, you can define all of these headers manually. Um, so I guess let's talk about that. 
So the from field doesn't actually have to be who the message is from. You might have heard of a term called email spoofing, right? This is where incoming messages might be uh, might say that they're from Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates, but it's actually not from Bill Gates, obviously, because he wouldn't be willing to send you a billion dollars for free, would he? Um, but essentially, you can just say that the email is from Bezos at Amazon.com or whatever, and the email system will be like, okay, and when you receive the message, it'll say it's from whoever they, it thinks it's from. Now, I know before you guys comment about uh, D, DKIM and SPF, Wait until the end of the video. I'm going to touch on those uh, and why spoofing and how email spoofing stuff works and how it's kind of being patched to be a little bit better than it was. In short, my point is you can just define these in a file when you send the message. Um, and of course, there's a couple um, other conventions that we use. For example, if you wanted to say the person's name in the to field, you can put the person's name and then you can use angle brackets uh, to put the email address. So you could say Tony Tascholo and then you would use like the little angle brackets, uh, open with the less than sign, uh, write the email address, close it with the greater than sign. Um, that's what I mean by angle brackets, to be able to include both a name and an email address. And the same thing goes for the from fields, the CC and the BCC. So I guess that's just a little convention. There's also a couple of other fields. For example, uh, when you reply to an email, how does your email client know to display that beneath the other email, right? Technically, they're just plain text messages. All, when you reply to an email, what's actually happening is your email system will open up the previous message, indent it over, and then you just write your reply above or below it. Uh, and it just sends this new email, new text file over to the other computer. Um, there's not really, it's, it's, it's really straightforward. There's nothing there's, I mean, of course, you typically have the, and most email clients do a pretty good job of when indenting, showing it in different colors or showing a bar or something to tell you, hey, this is a reply. But in short, essentially, it's just the same message that gets copied, edited, and sent again. Um, it's just a new text file that you're sending, basically, that just happens to include the contents of the old file. Except there is a special header uh, that will let you mark a message as a reply to another message. And this way, if I include that in the header, um, which almost all mail clients will, uh, when I receive the message, I will know, for example, that, hey, this is a reply to, I will know that this is a reply to this other message that I sent. Um, and I guess the other convention is to put an RE at the front of the subject. Same thing if you're forwarding, you will put an FWD to indicate that it's a forwarded message, but you're just Control C, Control V in the text file, maybe editing a couple things and sending it off. Now let's talk about the difference between two CC and BCC, because those are three ways you can address a file, address an email to someone. Uh, two is the most obvious. When I'm sending a message, the to field is who I want the message to be delivered to. Um, just like on an envelope, you would have your to, and of course, as a good Samaritan, your from address should be your own email. Um, pretty straightforward. If I send a message and I put you in the to field and I send the message, you're going to receive the message, no problems. Uh, let's talk about what CC is. CC stands for carbon copy. Um, for those of you that don't know, carbon copy paper is essentially paper that you would use when you're filling out a form. Um, and there's some carbon on the back and it'll basically just fill out a second copy of it, right? It's basically like creating a photocopy at the time of when, when you're filling it out. Um, so, and CC is generally used if you want to keep someone in the loop for a particular chain of messages. Um, you can use, for example, if you need to CC your supervisor or you want to CC your buddy or whatever in on a particular conversation, you can do that. CC fields are in private. The person receiving the message in the to field can look and see, hey, this person has been CC'd, so they got a copy of this message. And this is kind of needed so that when you reply, you can also send a copy of the message to them. So CC is generally very commonplace. Um, and when you reply, you can re include the person who's been CC'd in on the message so that they can stay in the loop. Um, they won't be addressed as the uh, the recipient of the mail message. The recipient of the message will show us whoever's in the to field, but they will get delivered a copy of the message essentially. So it's a way to keep people in the loop for a given conversation. The third field parameter is BCC. BCC is blackout carbon copy. Um, more people should know about this 
and don't, particularly teachers that like to send mass mailing lists that are classes. Uh, the way BCC works is it's basically just like CC. You use it if you want to keep people in the loop. But the, pers the, other pe the people receiving the message cannot see the BCC addresses. So say I send a message to someone and I put my supervisor in the BCC field. The person opening the message, the recipient of the message, will not see anyone in the BCC or CC fields. It'll look like the message was sent to just them. Uh, the people in the BCC fields won't show up. Similarly, if I uh, b put five people on the BCC, let's say I need to uh, send a message to five of my friends and I don't want them to see each other. When I send the message with BC uh, and putting them in the BCC field, when they open the message, they won't be able to see each other's addresses. It'll look like they were the only one that received the message. In fact, there's actually a catch with this, which is that... Um, if you have people in the BCC field, but not in the to field, when you open up the message, it'll show up as undisclosed recipients. Because if I just sent a message with my five buddies in the BCC field, uh, then the message doesn't actually have a recipient because there's no one in the to field, right? Um, and as I said, these are carbon copies. So it's just a way of sending a copy of a message to someone. It's whoever's in the to field should be getting the actual message. So if you've been BCC'd on an email um, and... Uh, you know, you're, because you're not in, there's no recipient, you'll know that the person sent it entirely BCC. Um, and if it's been sent, as I said, to everyone who's BCC'd, uh, there's no one in the to field, it'll show up as undisclosed recipients. This, of course, looks quite sketchy when you receive an email that was probably sent to thousands of people that says that you've been selected as a winner for this billion dollar prize. Um, kind of suspicious to say undisclosed recipients. So what a lot of people like to do is they will put themselves in the to field. So essentially the mail will be sent and delivered back to them. They'll get a copy of it uh, since they're the recipient. But this way, whenever anyone else looks at their inbox, the recipient will show up as the person who sent the mail or whoever was in the to field. So as long as you have one address in the to field, it'll show up as they're the recipient and not as undisclosed recipients. So it looks a little less sketch. Now, the reason I said that more people should know about BCC is because when I was in high school, a number of teachers liked to make mailing lists for sending information about their clubs and after-school extracurricular activities. But almost all of them used the two fields. This meant that if you're sending a message to 100 people and you sent the message, all 100 people get each other's email addresses. I mean, it's fine if it's a small group, right, and you're, you want each other to have contact. But if you're sending a message to like hundreds of people, you know, Maybe you don't want to include everyone's email addresses because then, you know, of course, some kid's going to click reply all and then start some spam chain. In fact, there was a uh, students who were in the TDSB a couple of years ago would remember that there were multiple incidents with this where people would start replying all to entire mailing lists. So everyone in the TDSB got a copy of about 500 emails in a, in a chain in a day. Um, anyway, anyway, that tangent aside, uh, basically, if you're going to, send a message to a old school mailing list that you have that doesn't use a you know regular mailing system um, where you can have someone sends a message to this one email address and then that mailer will forward it to everyone which is what most programming groups do for example uh, you can use any of the linux kernel mailing list, list as an example or the open embedded mailing lists where I send a message to this one email address, like lists.openembedded.org or whatever, and that server will then forward it to everyone. But if you're going to do this manually and you're going to send a message to hundreds of people, put them in the BCC field just to avoid the chaos afterwards. There's also another field called reply to, which is, as it sounds, the when you click reply, it's the address that the reply should be sent to. This is important because there are a number of email addresses that are used for only sending outgoing messages, but they don't have the capability to receive because they don't have a mailbox on a disk. Uh, very common with like, uh, if you change your password on a website or if you sign up for a website, um, they'll have these no reply email addresses because the accounts that are being used to send them don't have mailboxes. It just cooks up this text file and sends it. And the thing is, as I said, you need to have a from address that you just write in the text file. So they'll just use this one address, like outgoing at whatever.com or like no reply at whatever.com because you can just put any email address in the from field. So they'll just put an email address like that, but there's no inbox. There's If, if you send a message to there, there's, it's not going to get routed. Um, so if you have outgoing only messages, but you want people to be able to reply, then you can use the reply to field to indicate what email address of replies should actually go to. 
So if I have an outgoing message, say it's outgoing at tonytashula.com, I can put reply to in, inbox at tonytashula.com. And that way, uh, if you open the message and you click reply, mail clients are smart enough to know, hey, I should actually send a reply to this other email address. And that's what they will do. So that's a brief overview on email message content. And while, while I'm on the subject of being able to send these group messages to hundreds of people, let's talk a bit about how sending group messages works. Unlike, I guess, some uh, instant messaging platforms where group messages mean, hey, everyone's in on this conversation, and if I send a message, sends to the server, and the server just puts it, forwards it, right? If you have mailing lists, that's exactly how that works. I send something to the open embedded mailing list, and that server will forward that uh, and over to everyone that's on the list. So that works similarly. But if I'm actually sending uh, to a mess email to 100 people, what actually happens is quite simple. It's essentially just going to connect to each of those 100 computers, copy this text file over, and say, hey, here's your message. So it basically just means you're just going to send this text file over to all 100 servers individually. Um, it's, again, kind of primitive, but it works perfectly fine. Maybe a little bit wasteful for bandwidth, especially given that replies include all past email conversations. But hey, plain text doesn't take up that much space, especially in the modern internet. Next, let's talk about how you get your messages from the email server. So earlier in this video, I talked about how these servers communicate with each other using mail transfer agents and simple mail transfer protocol to send these text files over between each other. Um, but when I open up Mozilla Thunderbird, or you go to gmail.com or outlook.com or whatever email app you use, um, you're not directly connected to the, like that's not necessarily on the same server, right? Mozilla Thunderbird runs on my laptop, but it's not my laptop that's sending and receiving the messages. So there has to be some way, there has to be some way that we're connecting these clients over to these email servers. So how does that work? Historically, if I wanted to send a message, I would have to connect over to the server. In the days of mainframes, this would have been using any one of many terminals and that those terminals would be connected over to the server. But I guess as technology has progressed, uh, now of course you can SSH into the mainframe and you can then run the physical mail command over from there. But that's not what you do either, right? Uh, instead, we use protocols called IMAP or POP3 or POP3. Let's talk about the difference between these. POP3 or POP3 came first and IMAP was a replacement. Let's talk about what each of these are. Back in the Unix days, you might have used a terminal connected to your mainframe to be able to send and receive your messages, but you're not SSHing into a server to check your messages these days, you know? You're either using a web client or you're using an application such as Mozilla Thunderbird or Outlook or any number of either mobile or desktop applications. Let's talk about how those connect. Uh, for a number of my examples, I'll be using Mozilla Thunderbird just because it's the most popular email client uh, in the Linux world. Um, there's many others. Uh, Evolution, which is included with GNOME. Kmail, which is included with KDE, so on and so forth. But Thunderbird, although I guess it's no longer technically Mozilla Thunderbird, it's an independent project, um, is the most popular. There are two key protocols that are used to connect and download your messages from servers to check your incoming messages. So as I said, you don't want to keep your computer on 24 seven. So we want these servers to buffer incoming messages for us. Just like how, if someone sends you a message on discord or messenger, um, you're going to have these servers that gather up these incoming messages for you. And then when you log on to the server, then you're going to be able to see them and reply to them. We want that for email, basically. We want to have this buffer of having the mail sit on the server when I'm not available, and then I'm going to be able to go to check it. Um, this is similar to how many people at IRC idle systems, so that because technically, if you weren't online in IRC, you would miss the whole conversation and no one could message you, just like email. In fact, IRC is, I guess, the messaging equivalent of email. It's different protocol, centralized in that regard, but um, it has the same quirks of being plain text only, just like email, and requiring people to be online, just like email servers. Um, but essentially, people would, would um, come up with these systems to stay online when they're sleeping or whatever, to 
gather up and collect these messages for them that could then be delivered when they log on. So that's what we want to do for email. And there are two, there are two protocols used. The first one is POP3 or POP3. This was the original protocol, and I'll talk about how it works. Um, and there's also the protocol that replaced it, which is called IMAP, I-M-A-P. Um, if you're connecting these days, you're probably going to be using IMAP, although people like Gmail are slowly phasing out IMAP. And in fact, on our university emails, uh, Microsoft has completely cut the functionality. Um, so you, I can no longer log in with IMAP, which is very, very unfortunate. Um, if anyone from UWaterloo IT is listening to this, please rethink, reconsider your decision of forcing people to use the proprietary Outlook apps. So let's start with POP3 because it's a lot simpler. POP3 does pretty much what I just described, where we're going to have the server buffer up the messages while we're offline. Then we're, we're going to connect and get our messages off the server. POP3 comes from a time when people had one major computing device. Then that would probably be their desktops at home or maybe a laptop. And server space was limited. So there was no need to keep messages on the server once you've read them, right? Because no one thought about having messages on both on multiple devices. But I'll get to that in a minute. In short, when I go to check a message with POP3, all the mail lives on your computer pretty much. Um, so what's going to happen is the it's going to check, ping the server and ask, hey, are there any new messages for me? If the answer is yes, it's going to copy them from the server over to your computer. And it can either do just that or some people had it delete the messages from the server. That's it. Now those messages are copied from the server. Essentially, you're just copying these plain text mail messages over from these plain text uh, message files over from the server to your local computer. Then you can check the email from your local computer um, just like you would normally. And if you're going to have different folders and stuff uh, in your inboxes, uh, that all happens locally. If you reply to emails for both POP3 and IMAP, uh, outgoing mail is still handled by SMTP. So you will send the mail to the server and the server will redirect it on, will forward it on your behalf. POP3 was great for keeping track of mail on a single machine. Now, I think you might see a couple of drawbacks to this. The first one is, what if I have both a laptop and a desktop or a laptop and a phone? What happens? Say I was only downloading the messages and then not touching them on the server. My laptop says, oh, cool. Here's all the list of read messages we have locally. There's two new emails. Let's download them. So it copies them over to my local mail folder. And I, you know, I read them on my laptop. When my phone goes to check, it's like, hey, there's two new messages. And it copies it again because there's no synchronization of state over which messages are read and unread, right? The computer never talks back to the server, the computer just gets data from the server. It doesn't send data to it. Um, and what this means is that if I have multiple devices, they're all essentially going to be fully independent. The states will not be synchronized across them. They act as independent devices. Um, so mail that I've read on my laptop will not get marked read on the server. And mail that I've read on my desktop won't get marked either. So when I check emails on either my laptop or my desktop, they won't be communicating with each other. So both of them will think the messages are new. Now, if I was telling uh, POP3 to delete the messages from the server after it downloads them, then it's even worse because then if I check the mess, if my laptop went to check the messages and it say, hey, there's two new messages and it copied them over and it deleted them off the server. Now there's no way for my phone to ever get those messages or my desktop to get those because they were read by the computer and then delete it off the server. This was great when servers didn't have very much space, right? And you were getting uh, mailbox sizes measured in megabytes, right? You had 100 megabytes to use for your mail. Um, so once it's downloaded the mail, there's no need to keep them on the server. We can free up that space so it would delete them. In fact, I still do things like this with ProtonMail. Well, if, I, if you have a free mail account and you only have 500 megabytes, once you're done with the mail, you can delete it if you don't need to have a copy. Um, and that's a case where it makes a lot of sense to do this. So as you can tell, that's one major drawback is that we only have this one way communication, the server sending us the new messages, but we're never communicating back to the server. Um, and there is a second thing, right? Most people I've spoken to don't really seem to take advantage of the fact that 
mailboxes can have many folders or directories inside them. Just because historically, it was basically just a directory that you were assigned over in like some Unix system somewhere. That's yours to do whatever you want to do with it, right? I can separate that into my inbox. I can have folders or directories within my inbox. I can have directories, you know. Uh, basically, there's nothing that stops you from having any number of filters, for example, right? To say, hey, I want incoming messages here to be moved here. And I guess Gmail kind of does this with their automatic sorting. But those are still predefined folders that they're using for like promotions or social or updates or whatever. Whereas you should just be able to make any number of folders for whatever you want. You can choose to archive your mail by the month or in the year. You can choose to make different, basically these different folders for different, uh, for different servers, different applications, different places where you've used your email, so on and so forth. Uh, particularly when you have like mailing lists. Uh, at work, I found it quite common that uh, everyone had a number of these folders set up so that they could receive it. But I guess the general population just uses the inbox, which uh, TLDR, if you're only using the inbox, consider making folders, right? Um, but anyway, the main drawback with POP3 is the fact that there, we only have this one-way sync and there's no feedback being synced to the server and there's no synchronization of the state. Um, the mailboxes are copied and kept on my system. Yes, I can make folders or whatever, but whatever I'm doing, it's happening on my local system and the server is not really finding out about it. It's pretty much staying independent. Um, and that's where IMAP comes in. So IMAP has pretty much completely replaced POP3 because it's basically it takes this one-way channel and makes it two-way. With IMAP, by default, the messages are kept on the server and then you do all your sorting and whatever on the server. It'll download a copy to your computer but when you view a message, when you move a message, when you copy a message into a folder, when you delete a message, all of those actions will be synchronized back with the server. So let's do back my example again. I receive two new email messages. I use IMAP. My computer's like, hey, two new messages. It copies them over. Uh, but then I view one and it says, and it pings the server and says, hey, mark this message as viewed because it's been opened locally. So now when my phone goes to check, it's like, oh, okay, there's only the one message, for example. Or if I view both of them, it'll know that there's no new messages. Like, it'll download them. Um, but this way, it doesn't, it won't get confused over whether those messages are read, unread, so on and so forth. So that's the main advantage of IMAP is that it gives us two-way communication. It's also great because, for example, if I had my mail, my filter set up to automatically sort these incoming messages into these folders, when I go to check on my phone, it will have the same folder structure, the same files, the same hierarchy, the same structure. Because um, any operation I made on my computer would have been sent back. Um, so it basically is a two-way synchronization between your local computer and the server. And when you perform actions on your local computer, it will then go and update those on the server. Obviously, this has like this has the one drawback that now, uh, because you're no longer like deleting messages and you're keeping everything on the server, it's a lot larger. But Essentially, it's great because it means that you can now keep a copy of everything on the server instead of keeping it on your local computer. So any number of devices that you have can all synchronize with the server. So I can go from laptop to server, server to desktop, so on and so forth, and all of these will be kept in sync. If you use something like the Gmail uh, web interface or an Outlook web interface, it behaves very similar to IMAP, but except that you know there's not really a local copy in that sense. It's when you send a message or when you do actions, it's just getting it's fetching it straight from the server. And I guess there is a local copy, but the local copy is in HTML in your web browser. <laughs> um, but you know when you read when you read your emails, when you reply to emails, so on, so on, so forth. Um, all of those actions are being synchronized with the server. So it's very much reminiscent of how IMAP works. Now I said that both POP3 and IMAP can, are used to receive incoming messages or synchronize the state with the server. What if I want to send a message, right? Uh, you do, like IMAP doesn't send messages. You might think that, oh, well, maybe, you know, you put the message into the sent box and it syncs with the server. And when the server gets something in the sent box, it sends it. But no, that's not. That's really not how it works. The uh, the sent box is actually a fake thing that we've made up, and I'll get to that later. Um, but essentially, to send emails, you're going to use SMTP. Now, I'd like to make one last remark about both POP3 and IMAP. So I said that IMAP is essentially synchronizing both. POP3 is essentially just downloading. It's a one-way synchronization. Um, but both of these have one common drawback, and that's that they're both pull notification, they're, they're both based on pulling updates from the server, 
right? So just like how you might have something do, um, so there's two ways of delivering updates over to systems, pull or push. Pull is very much like software polling. Essentially, every X minutes, every five minutes, every 10 minutes, you're going to do polling. You're going to ask the server, hey, are there any new messages for me? And you're going to copy them. 10 minutes later, you're going to say, hey, are there any new messages for me? And you're going to copy them over. And then, you know, 10 minutes later, it's going to do the same thing. So something like Mozilla Thunderbird will actually just go and check with the server every X minutes. Um, and that's kind of how it historically worked, is every X minutes you would ask the server, is there anything new to me? Obviously, this is kind of inefficient um, because even if there's nothing new for you, you're still performing that exchange. In the modern internet, is this really something that major? Absolutely not, but it is something to consider. The other version is push. Uh, push is essentially like interrupts. It's the opposite of polling. It's the server will interrupt me and say, hey, you have new messages, deal with it. Um, so I don't have to, I'm not going to ping the server asking, is there any new messages? Instead, when the server does get a new message, it's going to send them to me and I'm, it's going to be like, Hey, you need to accept these. And that's kind of how sending emails works with SMTP, right? Uh, it's going to forcefully connect to the server and push the messages over to that server. The server doesn't poll. It does not do a poll to say, hey, are there new messages for my users over here? It's just going to get messages pushed to it when the message is sent. For example, if I send an email again from my in website over to a Gmail user, uh, I push that message over to Gmail and Gmail deals with it. Gmail doesn't come asking my server, you got any new messages coming for me? Uh, unlike, I guess, the traditional postal system, which is poll-based, right? Where, well, it's a mix of pull and push, where if I'm using the neighborhood mailbox, got to wait for the mailman to come and I got to wait for the, the the mail workers to come and basically pull the mail from the mailbox and then it'll be pushed over to the other side. But, you know, you get you get the point. Whereas with SMTP, I'm directly pushing and telling SMTP, hey, send this message now. Both SMTP, sorry, both POP3 and IMAP are used to receive messages and download or synchronize messages from this between the server. Um, if you want to send a message, right, you want to reply, you still use SMTP, but instead you use the SMTP address of your server, right? So in this case, your computer will then connect with SMTP over to your mail server, such as Gmail or my website or SMTP running on my web server, and it'll send it using that. So the sending part is still done with SMTP. All right, now a couple of minutes ago, I said that the sent box or your out box is actually fake. What do I mean by this? Well, if you think back to what I said about regular Unix mail, um, when you send a message, you're essentially just generating this text file and copying it over to the other person, right? There's no provision baked into the system to keep a copy of that message for myself, something, right? So for example, if I'm using Git and doing a Git send email, it can just generate the email and send it directly, but it doesn't go in my outbox. So basically, your outbox doesn't need to contain the messages you sent, right? You can use SMTP to send a message directly over to someone. And no local local copy of that will ever be saved. You won't, you might not even know what you sent, right? Um, I could use, uh, I could send uh, some text over from slash dev slash uh, random or slash you random. And, uh, you know, I can send it over and I won't even know what I sent necessarily. So... The sent box is, I guess, just a convenience that has been made up, just like the draft box, right? If I, if you're editing a message, most mail system, most mail clients like Thunderbird will save a copy of the message you're editing into your draft box. So this way you can close it and then open it. Um, and the mail server doesn't have a distinction between incoming messages that are put in your inbox and these messages. They're all just plain text email files. And the sent box is very similar. When your mail client performs an SMTP uh, query to send the message over, it will basically just copy a version of, it will save a copy of that text file over to the sent box just so you have it as future for future reference. Um, and if your mail client wasn't copying it over before it sent it with SMTP, well, I mean, I guess maybe you'd have a copy in your drafts bin, but there's no provision that requires it to save a copy. So it's something that's kind of done for convenience. It, it's now, of course, it's not necessarily fake, but the reason I called it fake is because 
it's your male client that's putting it there and then sending the file, right? It's not actually the messages you sent because there's no history of the messages you sent. No one knows. Maybe the, well, the SMTP server knows, but you know, you don't directly have a copy without checking the server logs. So the sent box is fake, uh, what I call it, because uh, basically your mail client will save a copy there and then send the message because the sending the message part means that, well, as I said, you're just sending the text file. If you don't save a copy of it, it's gone. It's poof, the other person has a copy of it now, but that's about it. Now, if you've been paying attention, I've been constantly using the word phrasing that email files are plain text. But you might be you might be watching this, you might be asking, what the heck do you mean emails are plain text? I've sent images to people. I was uh, you know, I was alive in 2010 and I was sending PowerPoint PPSX files over to all my friends, you know, and sharing them with the 500 people in these massive mailing chains. Or no, I sent these PDF files that some company asked for over in an email. What do you mean that email is only plain text? I would have included this picture. Um, but the point remains, that email is actually plain text. Uh, or, you, or you might say, oh, well, what about this fancy marketing uh, email that I got? You know, it has colors and pictures everywhere. How is that done? Um, let's talk about email attachments. No, I wasn't lying before. Email truly is plain text. You can open any of those files with a hex editor and see that it is just ASCII. Asterisk, technically, uh, there is, you can, uh, I, I, we, we can get into the fine details about how email is now Unicode or uh, UTF-8. For the simplicity of this video, uh, I will assume that emails are the original ASCII uh, messages. Yes, UTF-8 and stuff is supported to be able to send accents. Uh, there's, you, can, you can read all about that on Wikipedia or your favorite website. You know, this video is already over an hour that I, I've been recording. So, um, How attachments work is they'll take the binary file that you're trying to attach and convert it to plain text. You might say, what do you mean converting this binary to plain text? Um, and uh, if you work with computers, you've probably heard of a number of protocols that you can use to guard regular binary in ASCII. The most common way of this is through base64 encoding. Um, base 60, there's also other types. You have base32, base64, base128 encoding. There's a whole number of different schemes you can use. So how does this work? Well, email uses base64 encoding, as I just said. So what base64 encoding is, is it will take the incoming binary uh, it'll take in six bits because it's 64. There's 64 different possibilities and assign them to one of 64 characters. So base64 uses uh, lowercase a to z, uppercase a to z, the numbers 0 to 9, uh, and two other symbols that are chosen. This is very similar to, for example, YouTube URLs or URLs produced by the shortening services, right? Bitly or uh, AdFly, you know, all of those. A very, very similar uh, scheme where you take, um, but those are just randomly generated, for example, but it's an example of base64, right? YouTube is basically base64. They use lowercase a to z, uppercase a to z, zero to nine. They use two different symbols than standard base64, but that's for browser compatibility. How does base64 work? Basically, it's going to take in six bits because it can represent 64 different options, and it's going to output a character an ASCII character, one of these 64 characters. That's it. Then it takes in the next six bits and it produces the next character. And then it takes the next six bits. Then it produces the next character. Now you might be saying, wait a second, but you know, the file you're trying to send might be a hundred bytes, but you're reading six bits at a time. Uh, and yeah, you, you, you're, you're right to be concerned there. And then uh, it'll basically just pad the end. Um, and you can see why these files are like 30% larger after they've been base64 encoded. Because one ASCII character is 8 bits. It's one byte, right? The lowercase letter A has this ASCII code. Uppercase A has this. Zero is this. For each of these characters we're producing, we are taking up 8 bits. But each character is only holding six bits of information, right? Because there's 64 different letters possible. So each one represents six bits. 
So we lost two bits, right? We have six bits coming in and eight bits going out to represent just those six bits. If, if like, um, if I'm not being clear here, each segment of six bits coming in is going to need eight bits because it's going to be represented by a single character, by an ASCII character in the output. So this is why these messages grow by 30%. You have eight over six here. And eight over six is going to give you one point. And uh, eight over six is going to give you uh, 1.333%. 1 1.3333. 1 uh, so this means that six comes in, eight comes out. The result is the ratio of the output to the input is 1.3 times larger. This is why 100 bytes in will make 133 bytes out. Um, and all these files will get grown. If you've used GPG to do encryption, you'll notice that GPG has a guard option. By default, what that means is it'll basically take your binary and it'll base64 encode it just like emails. Now, the advantage of this is there's no invalid random binary, right? Because there's a lot of different control signals that are used by computers. You might send random ones and zeros, but you know, could be you could, you might be sending control signals, you might be sending any type of other sequence. But when you do it this way, it's very clear that, oh, okay, you're sending these guarded letters because they're just ASCII characters that are being sent. And it's a great way to be able to convert anything over to plain text. And you might say, well, as I said, why don't you just conk the binary of this JPEG file into the text file? You know, the text files ones and zeros, JPEG is ones and zeros. Why don't you just put it here? But that's because those ones and zeros that make up a JPEG image might become letters. They might become random characters. They might become control sequences. They might become God knows what. Uh, and this way, you can take all of those and guard it into the section of regular ASCII characters. You know, you don't need to worry about what the binary would represent if the computer tried to interpret it. All right, so you might be thinking to yourself, well, this base64 encoding sounds terribly inefficient. You know, we're making our emails larger every time we add attachments. And uh, yes, we are. Um, but you can, on some systems, you can actually implement, um, just include the binary file. Uh, this is called 8-bit mode. It's part of some mail transfer agents and protocols, um, but it certainly is not universal. And if it's not supported, things tend to fall back to the base64 encoded versions. I talked about, okay, this base64 encoding, how we change binary to ASCII. Um, but how exactly does this play a role? So for emails where pictures and stuff are attachments, then you will add that to the header of the file. You will have an attachment section and you will include the base64 for these attachments. Same thing for PDFs, same thing for Word files, PowerPoints, whatever. In all of those cases, you're basically just going to take the ones and zeros that make up that file, base64 encode it, and include that generated base64 uh, string over with the email message. Now, there are some, I guess, attach, there's, there's some things you can do to an email that won't be base64 encoded. For example, all those fancy marketing emails that you've been seeing with colors and layouts, you know, those, those aren't plain text. Uh, and indeed, they're not, but they also are. So the encoding is plain text, but basically those are just HTML messages. So you might say HTML, like, you know, HTML used to make websites. And uh, yes, email uses a way was needed to stylize emails. And email clients were beginning to like, you know, Mozilla Thunderbird shares a lot of code with Firefox. And so I guess the engineering hack was instead of starting from scratch with a new protocol, you know, ugh, uh, you know, instead of like reinventing the wheel, they basically just said, hey, HTML is plain text. Why don't we just piggyback off of HTML and, you know, just render the content that way and use CSS to just add colors or whatever. And that's exactly what was done. So an email really is like a single page uh, website. I mean, that's how I used to send old emails uh, when I wanted to be fancy. I would just grab the single HTML source for a single page on a website and you could just send that off as an email and it would look a lot fancier. Uh, and of course, there's some limitations. You're not going to be able to include a whole site in an email. You know, it's basically just think of it like you're loading a web page, but you get to send that page over to people. 
So you could just send the HTML for the page. Um, and you can just inline the CSS, so on and so forth. Uh, and that's what works. Now, you might ask, what if people don't have an HTML capable email client? Um, and in a lot of cases, what will actually happen is the mail will get sent as both plain text and HTML. Uh, and when I say HTML, you might be thinking, oh, it's for those fancy like marketing brochures. But actually, anytime you want to change the font, the font size, the color, bold, italics, underline, bullet points, URLs, hyperlinks, those all require the HTML functionalities so that you can do EM emphasis for italics or strong for bold, uh, H1 through H6 for your headings. Um, different fonts through embedded CSS, uh, same with different colors, different font sizes through CSS, uh, bullet points through unordered lists versus itemized lists versus ordered lists, you know, versus hyperlinks as A tags with hrefs, you know. So a lot of it, all of that functionality kind of requires the HTML uh, foundation so that you can have all of those. And I mean, you can't really blame them because they're, I mean, they could have, I guess, done like RTF rich text files. But at that point, you wanted something that's plain text and HTML is saved as plain text on the disk, right? Hypertext markup language. It's just the, reg the text that includes these little tags that you use like H1 or A or bold or, you know, so on and so forth. Um, so kind of just utilizes that system. Then this means that, like, I mean, it's funny how a lot of people can send plain text emails. And I've seen companies where it's like the only thing that forced the email to be turned from plain text to an HTML one was the signature. They hyperlinked the company website or they put bold or emphasis on their name, so on and so forth, right? The rest of it is actually just the simple, really simple plain text. Yeah, I mean, for example, uh, programs like Mozilla Thunderbird will ask you. You can send emails in plain text mode where it's just text. You can send in HTML mode where if you play, you can HTML encode plain text. It'll basically just put the whole thing in a P tag and call it a day. Um, or in many cases, emails will be sent as both plain text with the pl and HTML. So it'll contain both of those in the same file. And depending on your mail client, if you're using a UI-based mail client like Mozilla Thunderbird or you're using webmail, it will read the HTML section. But if you're using a command line mail client, something like Mutt, it will scroll down or scroll up and just give you the plain text uh, version of the email. And you'll know if they only sent an HTML but no plain text version because then, you know, Mutt will start showing the HTML code because uh, it only renders plain text because it's in a terminal. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how uh, stylized emails work. Uh, it's just HTML. Um, and attachments are just base64 encoded binary files that are just, you know, chucked up in an attachment section. Even like, uh, so I mean, I guess Im images have two versions. You can attach images, but you can also have inline images. For example, you'll notice some companies put like the company logo at the signature or whatever. But same thing, it's just base64 encoded like JPEG. I mean, I guess JPEG would have come after. I guess originally they would have used GIF or, or GIF or uh, PNG. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll do a separate video about graphics and the limitations of 256 color GIF files or uh, losslessly compressed PNG files some other day. <laughs> but yeah, that's kind of just how attachments and stylized emails work. The next point I want to touch on is encryption, right? So as I said, a lot of this is not only plain text, but clear text. So what do I mean by that? I mean, if someone was spoofing your network, they would be able to see what emails you were sending and receiving because historically it was just sending ones, the ones and zeros, like the literal characters that made up your email message over the network. Um, because just like Telnet, uh, it's, it's, as I said, SMTP is really similar to, I guess, from the era where Telnet was the norm. Um, and so there wasn't the thought given it to encryption because networks were like across universities and big institutions, right? So that wasn't really something you had to worry about. Um, so SMTP started out as it would just send these email files, these, these plain text files, just, you know, in the clear, just like how HTTP sends the HTML text files for the website in the clear. Um, but, you know, it was becoming obvious that some, we, we needed to, you know, 
we we needed a way to make emails a little bit more secure than plain text and clear text being sent. So just like how it was kind of a hacky add-on to add HTML support, what do you do when you need encryption? Hack on SSL TLS support, you know? Just, uh, it's been, for example, SSL TLS is the same encryption that's used on for loading websites over HTTPS. The S stands for, I guess, SSL or secure. Um, I guess technically now it's called TLS, which is transport layer security versus SSL, which is secure socket layer. Uh, whatever, we can get into the details and argue about that in some other video. But essentially, uh, SSL TLS is not end-to-end -end encryption, but what it is, is it'll you do something like a Diffie-Hellman key exchange to come up with a uh, shared key across the server and the client. So communications between a client and the server are encrypted and server to server are encrypted, but either of the endpoints can see the communication because, you know, it needs to do something with it. So, um, just like how uh, HTTP became HTTPS, you just tunnel. Basically, the, the reason we went with it is because it's just, just um, in, the, in, the, in the layer of abstraction, right? Link layer, network layer, transport layer, and then your application layer. We, the, 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 each of these layers can just convert something to something, right? We like having these layered approaches to a number of things. Uh, so, for example, just like how content encoded email is just fancy up here, but it's just an HTML encoder and decoder, uh, you, you just add a stage that's the SSL TLS encryption and decryption. So anything below that was now encrypted, and anything above it is uh, clear text. And it's great because basically what it is is you're sending cipher text now, I guess, and it's just the you just encrypt the web page and you send it off. Uh, it's how HTTPS works. The same thing was adopted when FTP became FTPS, uh, the S at the end, just like how HTTP is HTTPS. It's just encrypted using SSL TLS encryption. And uh, not to be confused with SFTP, SFTP is FTP over SSH, which uses SSH's encryption, SSH being secure shell. Um, that's a separate discussion. I can talk about FTPS versus SFTP some other time. Um, Basically, just like those, we implemented the same thing where these we're just going to take these email messages, encrypt them with SSL TLS, and send them off. And this way, uh, client to server is encrypted and server to server communications are encrypted. Now, it's not end to end encrypted like something like uh, Proton Mail. And Proton Mail is not end to end encrypted if it's talking with random people, right? It's only end to end encrypted if you did a key exchange with the person. Because, um, I mean, end to end encryption was never really thought about when email was implemented. Um, for end-to-end -end encryption, you would need the person on one end and the person on the other end to exchange public and private keys. And then the client could encrypt its email with the public key of the recipient, send it off, the recipient uses their private key to decrypt it. And this way, none of the servers along the chain would know about any of the contents of the email, only the starting and the ending person. Um, and the starting wouldn't either, I guess, after they've encrypted it with the public key. And, you know, they leave their public key in the email. So when uh, person B uses their private key, opens the email, and they want to send a reply, they can use A's public key. Um, and I guess there's, I guess, two, two main ways is, um, I guess the big way is people use PGP, pretty good privacy, uh, or the more common implementation, GPG or GNU Privacy Guard, uh, to just literally attach public keys to emails and then you can encrypt your email with someone's public key and they will decrypt it with their own public key. It hasn't been retrofitted in the same exact way, um, but it's a simple, I guess, solution to get end-to-end -end encrypted messages. And that's email encryption. By default, you will have, you can encrypt the stuff on your hard drive, but by default, it'll be encrypted in transport, encrypted in transit, uh, but servers will know what's happening. And uh, if you want more security, you can create a public private key uh, with a GPG, upload your public key to a key server. So when people want to send you an email, they look your email address up in a key server. If you have a public key, they'll encrypt it and send it off to you. Um, there are a number of examples of this. I used to have a public key on my website. I don't think it's active now, but if people still have it, I still have the private key. So you can encrypt the emails. And that's how end to end. I mean, end to end encryption does also have uh, some limitations still. For example, the subject line usually is not encrypted. Um, just so that mail clients can search through it and whatnot. But in the entire mail content section will be encrypted and as will any attachments uh, you have and so on. Um, so I guess that's the next step. Obviously, 
people like Google are not in a big rush to implement end-to-end -end encryption because their whole scheme of uh, wiretapping emails and selling your data as it travels through the network isn't really possible if the emails are end-to-end -end encrypted because only the two people would be able to see it unless they use some front-end code to scrape through it after it's been decrypted and sell, the, sell you ads then. Um, but I have a feeling that that's why we never went from server-side encryption to end-to-end -to -end encryption, even though email is a perfect um, use case for this, uh, where you it really is fundamentally possible because in the end, you're uploading a message to a server, sending it, and then the other person's server receives it and then sends it over to their computer. You're going from person to person. So it's absolutely possible that we could have had a fully end-to-end -end encrypted network. But yes, uh, ProtonMail, I guess, is end-to-end -end encrypted uh, within internally, and so is Tutanota. And uh, you can always attach public keys when you send emails if you want people to encrypt the emails back. And um, again, that's also really simple. You basically just take the text, run it through GPG, send the encrypted text, and the receiving person just gets the email, runs it through GPG-D, and gets the plain text back. So quite a simple scheme, um, but I, GPG is, I guess, pretty robust and uh, has been used for this purpose um, in many cases. All right, the last point I want to talk about before I leave off this video, I've been recording for over two hours now, so I think I'm reaching the time when I should probably cut part one of this video down. And I think I this is the last thing I want to talk about in this email umbrella. And that is, uh, I mentioned earlier on about mail spoofing, and I said that you basically just set the front field. Um, and I want to add a little point on this. Uh, basically, what this means is that the the task of checking whether an email is legitimate or not sell, uh, falls on the receiver, not the sender. Anyone can send any number of email messages, but it's the receiver that has to check if those email messages are legitimate or if they're spam. Given that more than given that almost like 90% of the emails sent are all spam or something, this clearly is an important task. Um, and of course, there's a number of spam filters, stuff like spam assassin that can be used in the whole AI-based uh, models. How does the receiving person know that, hey, when someone says the email is from this person, how do we know that it's actually from that person? How come, how come if I send a message as Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates, which I obviously wouldn't do, um, how come... That, that if, if, if you manage to receive the email at all, it'll just land in your spam bin. Like your mail in, your, your mail client will know that, hey, this, this, this isn't right. This, this shouldn't go in the inbox. Same with, you know, if, if, I, if I send an email and I spoof someone else's uh, message, actually this depends. If, I, if you spoof at Gmail or Hotmail address, it'll probably get picked up really quickly. If you spoof another website, it depends on what I'm about to tell you. And that is, it comes down to, an, we've um, extended the email protocol uh, over on over the years to um, try to make the system more robust against poofing and against these types of spam. Um, and the two main tools against that are called DKIM and SPF. Uh, you can set up DKIM SPF on your domain name. Uh, it involves adding some fields into your DNS. And this way, whenever a person receives an email, for example, if you receive an email that's anything from tonitashjoli.com, your receiving client can send a query look up in my website's DNS, look for those fields, and then it will know if I truly am that server um, because I will include stuff in the mail header uh, that the client can then use that, it can use the DNS, and it can actually check and make sure, hey, yes, this email is actually from Tony's server. Think of it a bit this way. This is the best, I guess, analogy I can come up with is if you have a private key, uh, key right, um, you can use it to sign items, and then anyone with your public key can verify it. So signing is kind of the opposite of encryption. With encryption, public key encrypts, private key decrypts. With signing, it's uh, the, only the private key can sign, but anyone with the public key can verify. Um, so uh, think think of it a bit like that, right? If I sign it, anyone can use my public key and check that if a file is uh, genuinely or authentically uh, produced by me. Um, and it's a bit it's it's a bit like that where uh, it's essentially like uh, the I sign off the email and then your client can check or I guess my SMTP server will sign off the email say like hey this is actually from this server um, and then the receiver can check against the public part which is the uh, DKM SPF uh, that live in the DNS and it can actually check hey is this actually legitimate all right I think I think that's where I'm going to leave leave off this video this has been my very long I guess. Uh, nerd edition video on 
email, how email works, what email is, you know, how it has evolved over the years and different parts of email that maybe you haven't ever thought about before. You know, how your computer connects to it, how we deal with attachments, how mail finds its way around the internet. So on and so forth. I, I, I hope you found this video interesting. Uh, I hope I didn't lose everyone in the first two minutes because it really is fascinating to me at, to find out about how fundamental technologies we use have been shaped over the years and evolved. Um, thank you so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something. Uh, see you next time.